Welcome to Podcast with Lara Axtell. In each episode of Podcast, Lara explores a current educational topic to identify practical solutions to help improve the future of education. Podcast is brought to you by Reading Horizons, the creator of a data driven literacy program for beginning readers, struggling readers, and English language learners of all ages. Visit readinghorizons.com to learn more. And now, Podcast with your host, Lara Axtell. Welcome to this episode of Podcast. One of the goals of Podcast is to provide a bridge between educational research and practice, and to share effective solutions with our audience of educators and parents. On our last episode, we featured Sarah Seiko from the National Center on Improving Literacy and two schools that have implemented research based literacy. Sarah joins us again for this episode on increasing family engagement and some of the new policies under the Every Student Succeeds Act. We'll jump back into that conversation where we left off in just a moment. In addition, Dr. Nicole Holland-Sims from the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network will provide both important research and practical options for creating family and school partnerships. Our last guest is a school superintendent in a district with a variety of challenges who shares some of the really innovative family engagement practices that have been successful there. Thanks for joining us today. We begin by continuing our conversation with Sarah Seiko. Welcome to the program, Sarah. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So you also lead the Parent and Family Strand at, at Ensel. Um, so what is your focus with families? We talked about, you know, the educator piece. What about families? Right. Yes, I, I do lead that work, and I'm really excited about our ability to focus on parents and families. I think we're unique as a national center that we not only target districts and schools, but also the alignment of what districts and schools are engaged in with parents and families and the role that they play. So our focus with families is to help them understand that important role they play through four key actions. And those actions are learn, advocate, partner, and support. And provide them with the necessary information and resources to fulfill these actions themselves and with others. So when you mentioned more about, you know, opportunities for leadership and involvement, what what could that look like? Yeah, that's an important question. I think really the advice that I often give schools is when you're engaging in your annual literacy planning, really think about the role that parents play and what any of these actions or activities mean for families and their children. So for example, parents and caregivers should be at the table to be an important voice for the decision-making around literacy goals for the school and methods for receiving information so that it's not just the school providing information to parents, but it truly is a push out and pull in approach where Parents feel welcome in the school community and feel empowered to have a voice at the table and participate in the literacy decision-making that's taking place, whether it be for goals, whether it be for resources that parents and caregivers might need, or even the types of training that would be beneficial for parents and educators to receive. So I think one important lever that is a fairly recent one, is that there are some new family engagement policy requirements for Title I Part A districts and schools in the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is one of the new federal education laws focused on governing elementary and secondary education. So if your school or district receives Title I funds, that district or school must write a family engagement policy that's developed jointly with parents and families. And that Title I policy around family engagement must provide parents of children with timely information about the programs being offered, a description and explanation of the curriculum in use at the school, the 
forms of academic assessment used to measure student progress, and the achievement levels of the challenging state academic standards. And if requested by parents, opportunities for regular meetings to formulate suggestions and to participate as appropriate in decisions related to their child's education and respond to those suggestions as soon as practically available. So there's really some really new federal policy pieces that can be capitalized on by schools to help strengthen partnerships between home and school around literacy. And as a component of that school level parent and family engagement policy, each school will develop a parent school compact. And a parent school compact outlines how parents and the entire school staff and students will share the responsibility for improved student academic achievement and how the school and the parents will build and develop a partnership to help children achieve the state's standards. So the compact focuses on two key areas, shared responsibility and parent-teacher communication. And those align really nicely with the roles that ENSEL is putting forth for families and parents and educators working together to improve literacy outcomes for all children. So they can go and visit your website and connect with a lot of the resources that are available. That's right. We often hear from parents, you know, we, we've asked, where do you go to get your information? And we've gotten a variety of answers. And I think parents and caregivers and even educators are really seeking one place where they can go to access vetted evidence-based resources that support the everyday work they're doing in classrooms, as well as their children's reading development at home. And we hope ENSEL is that one source for high quality information for both educators and parents and caregivers and their ability to work effectively together. So could you give us your website one more time? Sure. It's improvingliteracy.org. So we definitely encourage everyone to check us out. Thank you so much. That was, you know, there's just a lot going on right now. It's a very exciting time, and but I think sometimes a frustrating time if people don't know where to go. So this is great. Thank you so much, Laura, for the opportunity to talk about this important topic and to share some information about Ensel. Today's topic is the partnership between schools and families. Our guest is Dr. Nicole Holland-Sims. Thank you for talking with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to talk about this topic. So we're discussing partnerships between families and schools. What is your role as it relates to these partnerships? So when I think about my current role related to family and school partnerships, my current role is an educational consultant for the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network out of the Harrisburg area in Pennsylvania. And when I initially began my career as a consultant, I was placed on the Family Engagement Initiative. And that's how our our system is broken down. So the initiatives are specific to certain topic areas. And family engagement was one that was near and dear to my heart because at the time I was engaging in dissertation research around the topic of school and family partnerships. So it felt like a natural fit. And from there, I was able to learn even more about the schools in Pennsylvania and what they were looking to do to really enhance their family engagement efforts. And one of the things that I learned through that work is that you have to be creative and think outside of the box. I'm a school psychologist by training. So even in my years in that role, I found that being engaged with families was paramount to making sure that students got the best services they could receive. And one thing I found is that in MDE or IEP meetings, individualized education plan meetings, sometimes the parents felt like they were against the school or the school was against them. And oftentimes in my role as the school psychologist, I was the liaison to make the family feel comfortable in having a voice and advocating for their students. So in my roles as a school psych and a consultant, I've just found family engagement to be the cornerstone of my work and very important to ensuring students really are successful in school and beyond. 
Well, let's talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, obviously for many years, the majority of parents would send their kids off to school and they would be there for six or seven hours. And then those children came home and there really wasn't much of a connection. So this may be rather obvious, but what are the benefits of parent involvement engagement with schools? It's funny you say obvious because I had someone mention that last week on another call and they were like, well, isn't it obvious that families should be a part of this process? And what we found was that it's not so obvious or it wouldn't be an issue (laughs) for a lot of the schools that we see are struggling with family engagement. So one of the things that I, I know to have been important in understanding this process of parent involvement or engagement is Joyce Epstein's work out of Johns Hopkins University. She talks about the homeschool and community being an overlapping sphere of influence, meaning each part of those pieces have a significant role in the system that surrounds a a child. And so it's important to know that those pieces benefit the student in a lot of various ways. Another thing that she talks about is this important connection to being an advocate for your student. So even though, again, it may seem obvious, but parents speaking up on behalf of their student really can make a difference in the overall educational experience that the student participates in. Now, for some parents, they may struggle with that because they may not feel that they have the wherewithal to know all of the educational jargon or all of the different nuances of how being a teacher is involved or even an administrator, what they have to do. So they may feel reluctant to engage, but we know that that's such a crucial part of ensuring that students get what they need. Another part that I think is important is led by the work of Sandra Christensen, and she talks about this from the concept of check and connect, which is a tier three intervention when we talk about multi-tiered systems of support. These are for students that are really in need of the most intensive supports, whether it's behaviorally, academically, or social emotionally. And one of the things that she saw is that when parents are heavily engaged or connected to the school and the students work in the school, they say they see an increase in attendance, behavior, and course performance, which in educational terms, we call the ABCs to predict the likelihood of a student completing school. So all of those pieces, when connected together, really can benefit the entire system, which, as I mentioned at the top, is community, home, and school. Could you talk a bit about what parent engagement actually looks like? So I know this is more than just parent attendance at a PTO meeting or participating in teacher conferences. What what does this kind of parent engagement look like? Great question. And I think in schools, oftentimes as educators, we have a mindset that engagement can only mean when a parent or a family comes to us or meets us at the school building. And in the research that I conducted around caregivers of children of incarcerated parents, what we found was that a lot of the engagement was taking place outside of the school. So again, Hoover, Dempsey, and Sandler, I rely heavily on their work. They talk about the difference between home-based involvement and school-based involvement. So in a lot of cases, even though a parent may not necessarily be present at every event that the school hosts, they may be carrying over the messaging that's needed while they're at home. And this may be as simple as asking about homework or asking how the day went, what teachers the students like, and then making sure that the messaging is consistent. So another place where I have seen engagement really work is around the concept of PBIS, or Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. So in schools, typically that utilize PBIS as a framework, they have identified specific expectations for the school, such as be ready, be respectful, be responsible. That's just one example. In families, they also could adopt similar expectations that mirror the school so that when they look at expectations such as being respectful at home, what does that look like versus being respectful at school and see where they align. That's consistent messaging. So that's a form of home-based involvement. I would also say that when we think about what this could look like, this may be meeting again parents where they are, families where they are. So for some families, and I'm sure at some point we'll talk about barriers because that's another component of family engagement that's so important. But one of the things that oftentimes happens is parents will say, I don't feel comfortable coming into the school building. Or when I was a student, I didn't have a great experience, so I'm really reluctant to go into the building. 
So some schools have had to be very creative and thinking about, should we meet at a local church or should we meet at a local community center and have our event there? And oftentimes what we found, particularly in settings where those locations are accessible to a lot of families, the rate of attendance tends to be higher. So when you think about what it could look like or should look like, it's being creative, thinking outside of the box. Another example that I'll give is one of the schools that I supported was a K through fourth grade elementary school building. And what they found is that a lot of the caregivers of the students were grandparents, not necessarily mom and dad. And the grandparents have a whole different experience as a caregiver. So this school was responsive to that and decided to hold a grandparents day where they brought in the grandparents in the afternoon and did activities with them, had the students connect with them. And it was just really an opportunity to expand beyond this concept of parent involvement to family involvement because these caregiver roles ebb and flow and change as our students change. So those are two examples where I've seen thought given about how to be more creative in getting people to attend. And those are great ideas. So let's let's kind of talk about that a little bit. Uh, besides what you mentioned, what gets in the way or prevents families from becoming more involved in their child's academic life? So this is oftentimes where I think schools really need to take a deeper dive and looking at what some of those barriers might be. So through my research, what I found from Miller and Kraft, who are school psychologists, they talk about three different types of barriers. One is practical, one is personal, and one is institutional. So a practical barrier for a family or a parent would be, let's say, they aren't able to access childcare for an evening event. So that prevents them from attending, or they work a certain shift and they can't come to a morning meeting, or they they don't have the transportation, or there's generational poverty. They, They just can't get access to certain things. So those are the practical barriers. And a lot of times that's what we see as far as barriers for parents attending. The personal ones I mentioned a little bit earlier, this may be just an overall mistrust of education as a system and thinking, I really don't have a voice, nothing I say will make a difference. All of that can be instrumental in preventing parents from being active participants. Additionally, institutionally, there may be some things that hinder parents from wanting to be active participants. And this might just, again, be their willingness to see if you know they're welcome in the building or if there's methods that have been used to improve their, their commitment to being able to participate. So all of those pieces can play a role. Additionally, as I said, some of them as families may just feel that there's no trust. They don't feel that I can be a piece of this pie. I rely on you as the educator to educate my child and I have a different role, so I don't wanna infringe on that. And sometimes that's cultural. So we have to be aware of all of those particular barriers that can really influence the amount of engagement or partnerships that can take place. So that, like, let's look at the flip side of that. So, you know, schools function generally fairly autonomously. They have lots of rules and things like that. Are schools sometimes reluctant to even encourage more family participation? Is that where some of this work has to start within the schools with the educators and administration? I would say yes. I have seen in some cases, and again, I'll provide an example, working in schools that have a PBIS or an MTSS team, and that's typically a core team of an administrator, teachers, school psychologist, school counselor, et cetera. And in those meetings, they're talking about school-wide data, and that school-wide data might be how many students were sent to the office this month or how many suspensions did we have. And for schools, that can be information that you want to hold close to your heart for fear of how the community may react or respond or what that data may provide as far as a visual or an optic of what's happening at the school. So for some teams and school teams, I should say, there's reluctance to have a family member as a member of that team. Now, in our PBIS structure, we highly encourage families to be active and participate in the PBIS development of what are the rules and expectations? What are some of the things we can provide to students in the form of acknowledgement systems, et cetera? So when you have that reluctance from the school side to have a family member participate, it creates 
sadly, a divide that probably could be avoided. What we've recommended to schools is if you're talking about data that you find to be sensitive or you're very worried about that, you can hold those data meetings on different days but allow the families to come in on maybe a bi-monthly basis rather than a monthly basis. Or if you're going to talk about data, make sure you engage with that family member that's a participant to say, this is sensitive information. We would hope that you would respect the the norms of our team. And that would be on a case-by-case basis. But I do feel as though educators need to feel comfortable to put the wall down to allow the families to participate. So that kind of brings up some additional points, one of which you mentioned. For example, the school calls for a meeting because of behavioral issues or because it's an IEP meeting or, you know, to review the evaluation results and things like that. And there are so many acronyms and often the parents have really very little information about what is happening and what things mean. Are there specific ways that that process can really be, you know, so that there is really a collaboration and that parents feel so that they are part of the team. Right. So what I've seen in in the work that I've done as a school psychologist is the importance of having communication with the family prior to those meetings. Hopefully what most school psychs are able to do is have the opportunity to review the report. And this is just an example based on solely that type of, of meeting. They would have the opportunity to review the report The parent would have a copy of the report prior to as well and be able to answer any particular questions that come up without being in front of an entire table of other educators, because sometimes that can be extremely daunting. And I know if it were me, if I went into a medical arena and I'm a layman and they're talking all around me, I want someone to be able to help me understand what is the bottom line here? What should I be focused on? And I I think sometimes we need to operate from that lens because as parents, we come in and we just want the best support we can get, but oftentimes we don't want to appear like we don't know or we don't want judgment passed on us. And so I think as schools, we need to be aware of those things and put ourselves in the shoes of our parents and say, if I was sitting at this table, would I know what IEP stands for? Would I know what uh, SLD, when we throw all of these terms out, we need to have almost a glossary available to parents. And through our patent system, we've tried to provide through our family engagement initiative, some of those one page documents that are very family friendly to help so that when parents come in, they have a reference that they can refer to. So they're not overwhelmed by all of the jargon and all of the things that are thrown at them at one time. And do you think some of those options have been more effective? Do you see that as a move in the right direction? I do. I do. Another thing that I've seen work as well is this concept of a cultural broker. And this comes out of the work of Beyond the Big Sale. So some of the schools that we worked with in Pennsylvania, we tried to give them that skill to think about who can they engage as a cultural broker. And what I mean by that is, for example, one school had a Nepali population that skyrocketed. And for the school system, they didn't really know how to react and respond or communicate well with the parents of the students that were from Nepal. So what they did, they were able to enlist the support of a Nepali pastor. And that pastor was able to give them some tips and hints on certain things to say, things to be respectful for that culture, and also communicate, be a liaison of communication between those the the system of the educational system of the school, and also the parents and families of that background. So I found that that to be helpful when you have parents and families who really do walk in, for lack of a better word, green to all of these nuances and all of the newness of the school system as a whole, and also maybe some of the jargon that we throw at them. It doesn't hurt to have people that you can reach out to, to help support some of these parents so that they feel more comfortable in that meeting setting or even interacting with other educators. And you've provided some really great examples. Uh, What about that? What about having parents be part of, you know, increasing parent engagement so that instead of it always being school, that other parents are participating in that piece of it as well? Absolutely. So the goal would be to engage parents to sort of serve as those liaisons. And in another school district that I supported, they decided to hire a parent engagement specialist 
who were actually parents in the school district and they became employees of the district. But their sole role was to create opportunities to enhance engagement with families, serve as that liaison, create opportunities, again, for students to also have activities that parents would want to come to. That's where Grandparents Day originated from, the parent engagement specialist. So the idea of utilizing already existing relationships with parents to turn that around and help them to be a branch or a bridge to other families who may not be as we see as engaged, that is to me a great way and a great approach to making sure that we're getting the parents that typically don't participate at the building to feel more comfortable being there. Thank you so much. That is really valuable information. And I think something that a lot of schools are wrestling with, actually. So your your discussion about really where they have to start and and being creative in even identifying ways to begin this process. Definitely. It's not easy work, <laughs> but when it's done well, it is well worth it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back. Podcast is sponsored by Reading Horizons, the creator of a data-driven literacy program for beginning readers, struggling readers, and English language learners of all ages. With data-informing software and teacher-led instruction, students receive targeted intervention that leads to rapid reading improvement. Visit readinghorizons.com demo to see if Reading Horizons is right for your school. Our final guest today will share some of the creative ways that his district has begun to think about and encourage family involvement and engagement. Dr. Zessiger, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of PodClast. Oh, it's my pleasure. Happy to be here. We are discussing parent engagement on this episode, and you were actually recommended as a school superintendent that has been leading your district in some dynamic strategies to engage families. So could you start by talking a little bit about your role, and then we're going to dive into, you know, what your recommendations would be? Sure. Shannon Valley is a, a rural district in Clearfield County, relatively economically disadvantaged with about six in 10 of our students receiving free and reduced meal services. So it's, it's challenging. We have a big district in that it's 94 square miles. Transportation at times is a factor. And so we really uh, have been targeting our, our parents and even more than just parents, families and extended families to try and increase that engagement. And, it, and it's always a challenge when you get into rural areas. So I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to talk about the topic. Could you start by talking about why you think school family partnerships are important and how they might differ from traditional parent involvement? Well, I, school family engagements, they're certainly crucial to student achievement and not just academically. It's for social and emotional growth and, and just students as overall well-rounded human beings. And, and we realize that everyone needs to be actively involved in the student and families today are so much more diverse. And as a result, we need to kind of connect with the strongest role models possible for students. And, and oftentimes that's a parent and that's great, but many times it's a grandparent, it's, a, it's an uncle, it's an aunt, it's a sibling, it's a foster parent. Really anyone who will be able to provide positive supports for the students. And so in a sense, it also holds the district more accountable because the more people that we have in that communication loop, the better chance we have at success for, for the students and for the faculty and staff in our school itself. So it would be very valuable to hear about some of the specific strategies that your district has developed to increase family engagement. Could you describe the process and maybe how it got started? Sure. We, we obviously have always valued family engagement, and several factors help us identify kind of targeting our needs including our comprehensive planning process, the kind of three-year strategic plan that the state requires. We participated in the Pennsylvania Department of Education School Climate Initiative. We were one of the pilot schools in that. And then really just observations from staff and, and administration. And we looked at our data and began trying to come up with some innovative ways to get families involved. An adult graduation program that I can go into some length on, family cooking classes, which is unique, and I'll certainly touch on that a Twitter campaign that we've used the last couple of years that's really done some great things for us. And then things like a brand new collaboration center that we're getting ready to open here uh, next Thursday. 
And if I just were to pick one of those because of, of time constraints, I'd highlight our, our cooking class. Obviously, when you're in a rural community and you're economically disadvantaged, eating healthy and eating smart is difficult. A lot of times families don't have the sit down around the table dinner that is kind of traditional. And so we partnered with our food service provider. Uh, it started off monthly. It's going to expand this year. But each month, we, at no expense to our families, invited uh, a grade level for, say, you know, first grade. And any students and parents that wanted to participate could come out and spend an evening in our cafeteria learning how to make a healthy food choice. They make it together as a family. They eat it together as a family. Things like fresh fruit and vegetable salsa, and they made uh, tortilla chips and some cinnamon and sugar tortilla chips for dessert. Um, and so they did everything from cut the tortillas and bake the chips and, and prepare all of the fruits and vegetables and make the salsa and then kind of reap the benefit of that by sitting down together and, and actually eating their meal as a family, sharing it with the other families that were involved. And so we made sure that this past year, every grade level had an opportunity. And we tried to make the meal uh, appropriate to the, to the age level so that, one, it's, it's family time together. It's a positive opportunity for students and parents to engage with the school district where it's, it's not that we're calling a, a child about their academics or their behavior. It's just a chance to, to engage as a family. And then we learn some healthy food choices as well. It goes along with our district wellness policy. So that's one example of kind of something maybe a, a little out of the ordinary that we've utilized to engage our families. It, it's been a wonderful opportunity. So you mentioned that one of the things that was kind of unique about this is that it wasn't connected at all to academics. Do you think having activities where you engage families and it's not at all about how well this child's doing in school uh, is an important con consideration? Yeah, and it goes back to what I stated earlier that, you know, student achievement is more than academics. You know, there's just some growth there. Here, we're just talking about some some family time together, uh, a chance to, to learn a little bit about wellness as we try to make healthier choices in the food selections that we made and learn a little bit about the, the process. We could even take some academics into it just from following the ingredients and the prep list of making the meal is, is teaching them how to interact on something that they may not get at home. So let's talk a little bit about results. Could you provide some examples of some of the things you mentioned with the cooking class, of course, how, you know, that really touched on a number of things. What do you think has been most effective just generally in terms of family engagement? Well, I, I think it's because we've taken a multifaceted approach. As I mentioned, we have a, a graduation program. We, we had a, a study that came out that showed that we had a real high percentage of of people in our community from 24 to 35 that did not have a high school diploma. So we opened up our cyber online cyber program that's in-house to any taxpayer resident in our district who does not have a high school diploma could come and enroll free of charge into our cyber program. And we've had several adults, a couple people that, you know, for what other, whatever reasons life took them, uh, military, some, family, others, where they were a credit or two shy of getting a high school diploma, and they've been able to come back and complete that. So we've, we've valued education and we've invited them in. We started a, a, the last two years a Twitter campaign where we, we pick a theme, but it's all academically focused, and teachers are sharing out what's going on in their classroom, what professional development they're doing, anything that, that's putting our academic programs in a positive light. And they started to share out what was going on in their room, to retweet and like what other teachers were doing, to learn about what was going on in the high school versus the elementary school. And when you talk about results, we are one of the smallest attendance schools in our county. The other school districts are larger. But our local paper does a Reader's Choice Award every year and this past year, 2018-19, we were selected as the best public school. And when we kind of did a little bit of research into that, part of it was is that people that were outside of our parents and our families were selecting Meshannon Valley based on what they had seen through social media and thinking, geez, there's a lot of great things going on there. So 
we've had some things like that that have, have provided some data in that that engagement is working outside of just our parents. And then we, we do all kinds of other things. Uh, and I think our Twitter campaign, we had more than a thousand positive messages in two years. So again, so you have some data to back that up. We've done some things like Breakfast with Santa, where we invite all the families in for free breakfast. We had over 200 adults participate last year. We partner with our community agencies, CYS and, and mental health, and have a safe trick-or-treat where the students can come around and, and get some candy, but the parents come around and get some literature and some contact and some information of the supports that our community has to provide them. This past year, we had more than 350 students that went through the line getting candy, uh, and again, all of them coming with their parents or family members. We hold a spring carnival that our participation has increased. So again, all that data, I, I think, goes back to what I said, that it's a multifaceted approach to really you know, moving this forward. And those are some great examples of just relatively simple things that many schools could do. Yeah, and not with a big investment of dollars. What are the factors that other schools listening may want to consider when making these changes? Are there some recommendations that you would give to other administrators? Yeah, I would. The kind of first I would say is you have to take a look at what your community expects because, you know, 500 Pennsylvania school districts and 500 different community expectations. So that is certainly, you know, first and foremost is to kind of gauge what is it that your community is looking for and, and to really know what that is, you really need to be doing some surveying. Again, we're part of the PDE school climate pilot, which does have student, staff, parent, and community surveys. So we're getting a broad range of information there. Listen to the unsolicited feedback. And, and it's not always presented in a constructive manner. You know, sometimes it's coming through Facebook and it's coming through other social media platforms and it's coming through the anonymous complaint letters or, or the public complaint when they're willing to put their name behind it. And so often it's easy to just discount that as a naysayer. And if you just take all that information and, and take the emotion out of it and, and use it as a, as a constructive data source, you can really start to, to see what it is that you need to do. And certainly in my district, we're, we're far from exemplary, but I think that we've started to really make a push to show the community that we value our families. We value the community members that, that aren't necessarily associated with the district. And we've tried to make it evident through things like the climate initiative and some of these other things that we've discussed that to let them know that we, we want to improve. We recognize there's a long way for us to go. We've admitted our shortcomings and sometimes that's tough. You know, Obviously, I'm a small school district. I can't be all things to all people. So I have to recognize where, where I can't be something and then say, okay, but here's where I can really be good or really improve and, and work on those avenues. Thank you so much for you know sharing just that, that experience, but also very specific examples. I think this is the conversation that a lot of districts are starting to have. And just by providing some, you know, examples and some of the successes you've had is really, really helpful. Well, I certainly appreciate I appreciate the opportunity to, to share Mershannon Valley's story about some of the work that we're doing. And I know that, you know, just from interacting with my colleagues, there's a ton of great work in this category going on in Pennsylvania. And I'm encouraged to, to listen and hear as, as you move through the years, what are the, th the other things that are important and, and how can we benefit it from it as well. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks to our guests today. School partnerships with families can be so important to improving student outcomes and something we may not hear enough about. We hope you found this information valuable and that you'll join us for our next episode with Rand Miller, who discusses cultural competence in the classroom. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Pod Class. If you enjoyed today's episode, leave us a review. To be notified when future episodes are available, subscribe to Pod Class on iTunes. Pod Class is brought to you by Reading Horizons, the creator of a data-driven literacy program for beginning readers, struggling readers, and English language learners of all ages. With data-informing software and teacher-led instruction, students receive targeted intervention that leads to rapid reading improvement. Visit readinghorizons.com slash trial for 14 days of free access to our software. Reading Horizons. Reading is for everyone.